A couple of weeks ago, we began what will turn into a very long reunification process between Joseph and his family as we're continuing this series, as Pastor Aaron mentioned, through this section of Genesis that deals primarily with Joseph. In our series, we are well past the low point, at least in Joseph's life. He's been out of prison for several years now. He's been the, the chief ruler of the country directly under Pharaoh. So he's had some good years. In fact, there were seven very, very good years, years of abundance. But we're now in the middle of seven years of extreme famine. A great famine that was forecasted by, er, and predicted by God through visions to Joseph, or well, actually through the king that Joseph interpreted. In fact, it was the severe famine, if you recall, that initiated the reunification between Joseph and his, his family, even though at this point in the story, Joseph is the only one that knows that's begun. The brothers have no idea that they've encountered their long-lost brother, Joseph. This evening, we're going to look at another chapter in, in this series. But before we look at this chapter, let's remember a couple of things that are important for us that will also, I think, tonight help us in particularly interpret what we find. One, let, let's not forget that this section of Genesis is not about Joseph. From, from a standpoint of the structure, this is Jacob's section, Joseph's father. It, it, but really, the section's not about Jacob either. The, the section, like every section of Genesis, is about God. This is revealing God to us. The section is showing God's faithfulness to the promises that, that God made way back to Abraham, which would have been Jacob's grandfather at this point, Joseph's great-grandfather. For several generations, God's been showing that even though the promises have not been fulfilled in that time, God has not forgotten what he promised. Every detail of the promises, both the, the physical details and the spiritual details, has been passed from one generation to the next. And now we're in the middle of Jacob's generation. We're, we're observing the flow of the promises to Jacob's children. The, the problem is that as we began seeing Jacob's children, the, the initial character of those sons were far from the character of those we would want to represent God to the world. And we certainly would not want them to be the ones that represents the promises of a faithful God because these sons of Jacob were anything but faithful, with the exception of Joseph. After all, these, by and large, the, the sons, 11 of the, the 12 sons, well, 10 of the 12, we'll say, exclude Benjamin, 10 of the 12 sons sold one of the twelve to, into slavery. That's the kind of faithful brothers they were. The only thing that stopped them at that level, not to sell him in slavery instead of killing him, you may recall, was that they, uh, two of them uh, resisted, Judah and Reuben. They, they, Reuben, we're not sure why he resisted. Judah resisted because he thought, well, we could get more money if we sell him in slavery, and he's, we're rid of him anyway. We need to remember this because in the last chapter, Joseph encountered his brothers. They came down to Egypt to buy grain, and, and Joseph encountered them there, and he put them to a test, a test that would determine whether their character had been transformed at all in the many intervening years between the time they sold him in slavery and the time they were kneeling before him in his courtroom or his, his palace room, throne room. You may recall the result of that test was inconclusive. Um, Joseph saw hints that the brothers might be different, but then we encountered Jacob, who favored the sons of Rachel. That was what caused the problem to begin with, the favoring of Joseph over the other brothers. Well, Jacob is continuing to have that favoritism, and he refused to allow the brothers to take Benjamin to Egypt, even though Joseph held Simeon, one of the other brothers, as as a hostage, essentially, imprisoned, while he sent the rest of the brothers home with food. 
we need to remember all these little details here as we see God at work. The, the second thing we should remember is that Moses is writing this record of the patriarchs' lives for the, the very, I guess I'll call it a fledgling nation, even though it's not really a nation at the time Moses is writing this. He's writing for the mass of Israelites that's traveling through the wilderness toward the promised land after 400 years of slavery in Egypt. These people are all descendants of the 12 sons of Jacob. But at this point, they're, they're really tr more a collection of tribes than they are a nation. But God has promised that from this collection of tribes, he will form a nation. And he has promised that he will give this nation the land of Canaan and that they will be his representatives to the world at large. They're just traveling toward that land at the time of writing. Everything that, that Moses is writing in these chapters Obviously, under inspiration, he's writing under inspiration of God. Everything he's writing is designed to prepare this nation to become that people of God, the people that will be God's representatives, that will show the world how faithful God is. The people need a transformation as much as the sons, 400 years plus earlier. Well, this evening, we're going to continue the story, and we're only going to, again, get a glimpse of the middle part of the story. We're only looking at one more chapter in this very long string of chapters. The story begins all the way back in chapter 37, and the end of this story won't come until chapter 50. We're only at chapter 43, so we're, we're still in the middle of things. That, that means we won't see the ultimate point that God is making through this long extended narrative, but, but that does not mean that we won't see God at work. Moses recorded this chapter because God inspired Moses to record this chapter, and it's revealing things about God. And for that reason, we can still find a lesson for us in this chapter, even if it's not the main lesson of the overall arc of the story. Let's start examining the chapter this evening. We'll hold our lesson for the end. We'll, we'll do it inductively again. Narratives, oftentimes, we, it's best to work our way through because the, the main point comes as you see how the pieces fit together. We're going to break the, the story down into three sections this evening. The, the first section runs through the first 15 verses. These verses show us the, the decision to return to Egypt the decision to return. You may recall that the previous chapter, a couple weeks ago when we looked at it, it ended with the brothers refusing to return to Egypt without Benjamin. Joseph had told them, or we'll just think of him as the ruler, because that's how they think of him. The ruler had told them that unless your brother's with you, you will die. From their perspective, he's an unreasonable ruler. He told them they would die the death of a spy, even though there was no evidence that they were spies. But you may recall the chapter ended as well with Jacob refusing to let them take Benjamin for more food. Still, from at least their combined perspective, Jacob and the brothers, the famine's not finished. So here we are in verse 1. Now the famine was severe in the land. So it came about when they had finished eating the grain which they had brought from Egypt that their father said to them, Go back, buy us a little food. Judah spoke to him, however, saying, The man solemnly warned us, You shall not see my face unless your brother is with you. If you send your brother with us, we will go down and buy you food. But if you do not send him, we will not go down. For the man said to us, You will not see my face unless your brother is with you. It's kind of maybe a more pleasant way of saying you will die, rather than just bring that blunt about it. He says, you will not see my face. Then Israel, said to, then Israel said, why did you treat me so badly by telling the man whether you still had another brother? But they said, the man questioned particularly about us and our relatives, saying, is your father still alive? Have you another brother? So we answered his questions. Could we possibly know that he would say, bring your brother down? Judah said to his father Israel, Send the, land, the lad with me, and we will rise and go, that we may live and not die, we as well as you and our little ones. I myself will be surety for him. You may hold me responsible for him. If I do not bring him back to you and set him before you, then let me bear the blame before you forever. For if we had not delayed, surely by now we could have returned twice. Then the father Israel said to them, If it must be so, 
then do this. Take some of the best products of the land in your bags and carry down to the man as a present a little balm and a little honey, aromatic gum and myrrh, pistachio nuts and almonds. Take double the money in your hand and take back in your hand the money that was returned in the mouth of your sacks. Perhaps it was a mistake. Take your brother also and arise, return to the man. And may God Almighty grant you compassion in the sight of the man so that he will release you your release to you your other brother and Benjamin. And as for me, if I am bereaved of my children, I am bereaved. So the men took this present, and they took double the money in their hand and Benjamin. Then they rose and went down to Egypt and stood before Joseph. Verse 1, if you happen to look back at chapter 41, the, the end of, of 41, verse 57, it, it's a virtual repeat. The, sam, the famine is bad. Things have not changed at all. That's the point that Moses is making, repeating that verse. The, the grain that the brothers had brought back on their donkeys when they came back to Canaan from Egypt after the first trip, well, they had fed the family for a while, but the situation remained bleak. Unless something was done quickly, that the chance of all of them starving death, it, it was a real possibility. Jacob looks at the brothers and he tells them, Return to Egypt. Go back, buy some more food. This time it's Judah instead of Reuben. Last time it was Reuben who spoke up initially, but now it's Judah who raises the issue of Benjamin's presence. Judah has not been the center of our action here since chapter 38. If you remember chapter 38, that was that really ugly chapter, that, that chapter that recorded the, the thoughtless treatment that Judah gave his daughter-in-law Tamar. And even though we've had a few hints along the way that Judah would play a significant role in the future, that he would become an important brother, so far all Judah has done as far as a purpose in the story is, is serve as a contrast to Joseph's faithfulness. Judah has not been faithful. But now Judah comes back to the center of the action, so to speak. He, he's the one who speaks up. In fact, from this point onward, Judah remains the main spokesman throughout the narrative for the other brothers. That, that's just another little hint Moses has given us along the way. Keep, keep an eye on him. Let, let, look for what God is doing. Look whether God has transformed Judah through the passing years. So Judah, he, he states the brother's position against the father. If you do not send Benjamin, we will not go down. You gotta wonder how many times that conversation went back and forth over the months. Even though the, the brothers couldn't understand why the ruler of Egypt accused them of being spies, they, they took his threat seriously. He, he told them they would die and if they didn't bring Benjamin, and they, they believed him on that. Furthermore, don't forget that they had found all their money mysteriously, I guess you'd say, appearing in their bags from their perspective. It just showed up there. They opened their bags of grain after they left Egypt, and there was their money. So presumably the, the ruler now in their mind would consider them thieves as well as spies, double whammy. They, they dare not face the ruler without meeting the, the main condition that he's placed on them, their brother's presence. Even though the earlier sections of, of Genesis had shown that Jacob, if you recall, had become a true worshiper of God, we saw Jacob... And when he was at Bethel, the first time as he was leaving land, worship God. And from there on, we saw other times of, of Jacob being a, a true worshiper of God. There, there's nothing in this section that, that presents him as what we would call a model worshiper. In, in some ways, I'm afraid many of us, myself included, reflect Jacob more often than we want. We worship God, but we're not model worshipers. Jacob's not a model worshiper. Verse 6 certainly does not show Jacob displaying a very high view of God's sovereignty. He, he acts as if everything is against him. Poor, poor me. Why did you treat me so badly? Everything's against him. And he complains that the sons had it out for him, even by, by telling the Egyptian ruler that they still had a younger brother back in their homeland. Well, the brothers rightly, in my opinion, protest their, their father's accusation. Why wouldn't they honestly answer the, the ruler? After all, he was accusing them of being spies. They need to convince him with everything they could say that we're not spies. 
Notice, though, that as they talk about this, Joseph, as we know him to be, is repeatedly just called the man in this section. He's the man that they interacted with. The man asked, we answered. That's essentially their response. There was no way they could have suspected that the, the man, the ruler, would insist that their last brother be brought back to Egypt. Again, now it's J Judah who speaks up. He, he actually uses Jacob's words against him in verse 8. Judah, prior to the first trip to Egypt, Jacob ordered the brothers back in chapter 42, verse 2, to go to Egypt so that he said, go down there, do something. He essentially was yelling at his sons for not doing anything about famine, and he told them, go down that we may live and not die. Well, now Judah picks up those same words and uses them towards his father. Let us go so that we all may live and not die. Let us take Benjamin and go to Egypt so that we may live, because unless they go and buy grain, the entire family will perish, including Benjamin. Then, in what really is the, the first of several surprising statements, I think, as we go with, when it comes to Judah, Judah promises to personally take responsibility for Benjamin's protection. Rather than the insensitive we, insensitivity that we saw back in 38 when he just treated his daughter-in-law like, like a piece of property, here we see Judah stepping out and even placing a stern condition upon himself to assure that his brother would be safe. Let me bear the blame forever if Benjamin is not brought back safely. That, that's the, the first sign we have here of, of any clear hope that, that there's transformation going on here in this man. Jacob at last, yields. He, he really has no choice. They need food. They, they either buy grain or everyone will die. So Jacob agrees to let Benjamin go with the brothers, and, and then he counsels them how they should approach the ruler of Egypt. They should take along gifts, some of the, the best export goods that Canaan has to offer. The famine's taken the food away, but there's still things that Canaan's been able to produce. Take these along as gifts. They should also take the money that they found in their sacks after the first trip, plus additional money to buy grain on this trip. And, of course, they should take their brother, Benjamin. Jacob's final words in verse 14 really still sound quite pitiful, though, when you read them. If I am bereaved of my children, then I am bereaved. The only redeeming point that, that we have, really, of Jacob is at least Jacob does entrust them to God Almighty. El Shaddai, may El Shaddai grant you compassion. God alone is the one who can ensure that this man in Egypt, this ruler, this man, God alone is the one that can ensure that this man grants them compassion. Now, I want to take just a moment and note the word that we have translated as compassion in verse 14. God Almighty, El Shaddai, may El Shaddai grant you compassion. That's how most of the English versions, other, or I should say is compassion, or most other English versions other than the Nasbury trans... And the Nasbury, where'd that come from? Haven't heard that version, the NASB, the, the New American Standard. The New American Standard translates it compassion. All the other English versions, I think, translate it with what word? Anybody have it? Mercy. This is the first occurrence of the, the Hebrew word that's normally translated, translated mercy in the Bible. And it occurs here at, within an invocation of God. Mercy comes from God. Mercy may flow through a human agent, yet God is the ultimate source of any and all experiences of mercy. God is the source of mercy. May God give mercy. The, the brothers, including Benjamin, they, they then make the trip to, from Canaan to Egypt, and in verses 16 to 25, we have what I would call the unexpected welcome in Egypt. The unexpected welcome. When Joseph saw Benjamin with them, he said to his house steward, Bring the men into the house and slay an animal and make ready for the men are about to dine with me, or the men are to dine with me at noon. So the man did as Joseph said and brought the men to Joseph's house. 
Now the men were afraid because they were brought to Joseph's house. And they said, It is because of the money that was returned in our sacks the first time that we are being brought in, that he may seek occasion against us and fall on us and take us for slaves with our donkeys. A little bit of panic there, right? So they came near to Joseph's house, steward, and spoke to him at the entrance of the house and said, Oh, my Lord, we indeed came down the first time by food. And when it came about, we came, when we came to the lodging place, that we opened our sacks, and behold, each man's money was in the mouth of his sack, our money in full. So we brought it back in our hand. We have also, we have also brought down other money in our hand to buy food. We do not know who put the money in our sacks. He said, Be at ease. Do not be afraid. Your God and the God of your father has given you treasure in your sacks. I had your money. Then he brought Simeon out to them. Then the man brought the men into Joseph's house and gave them water. And they washed their feet and he gave them their donkey's fodder. So they prepared the present for Joseph's coming at noon. For they had heard that they were to eat a meal there. I don't know if you noticed it as I read through these verses, but there, there's no mention at all about the accusation of the brothers being spies. As we observed in the, the last chapter, Joseph was using that accusation as a test. He, time and again, he accused them being spies, testing them to see what they would do regarding their brother. Well, since they'd returned and, and since he could see Benjamin with them, the, the accusation no longer served any purpose, and it simply dropped. It never comes up. I gotta wonder what the brothers thought about that. Here they were anticipating being thought of as spies and thieves. I have to believe in that their heads were probably starting to spin right from the beginning, just trying to figure out what is going on if they come to the ruler's house and then they're told, you're going to dine with him. Now, we do see, obviously, they suspected the meal might be a trap. They, they assume that the accusation of spies was waiting, and, and maybe it's going to be replaced with the accusation of being thieves once they come before the ruler. So immediately they try to plead their case. They, they go to Joseph's house steward, and, and they give a, a very quick summary, just blurting it out. We found our money. Here, here's what happened. We found our money. Here it is. You, you can even imagine them frankly holding it and shaking the purse. Here it is. We, we got it right here with you, with us. It's yours. In fact, look, we have more money. We, we have money to buy food. We're, we're not trying to steal anything. You got to love, you know, at least I do, how the steward plays things. Obviously, he knows about Joseph's trick with the money. Who knows? Maybe it's the same man that Joseph used to put the money in the sack. We don't know. But now he just brushes off. Don't worry, I had your money all along. Again, their head must just be spinning, huh? What? Still, we need to look closely at how the steward words his brush off. For the second time in the chapter, God is invoked. Your God and the God of your fathers has given you treasure. Verse 23. The man attributes to what has happened to them to God's working in their life. He, he refers to the money in their sacks as treasure. That, that's a word that usually means something that's concealed or even buried, you know, buried treasure. The implication is that, that God is revealing what's been concealed. Then, as, as proof that they're not in danger, Simeon's immediately brought out and allowed to join them. No explanation is given. The condition of his release is simply there because Benjamin arrived. And nothing more is said. That's got to be some surprises. But then the surprises are not finished. The steward brings the brothers in Joseph's house for a meal and, and treats them as honored guests. That's the point of, of giving them water and allowing them to wash their feet and giving fodder to their donkeys. That's how you treat honored guests. Having just heard the servant invoke the name of God, I, I would think they could not help but wonder what God might be doing in their lives with this transition from suspected spies and thieves to honored guests. All we know is what we're told, though, in verse 25, since they 
recognize they're to have a meal with the great ruler of Egypt, that the man prepared the gift they've brought. Their dad told them, bring this gift that will help soften up the ruler. Well, they, they set about preparing it so that they can present it to him as soon as possible. The steward's words should have allayed some of their fears, but they're going to do all they can to, to stack the chances in their favor that when they do see the man again, that, that he will grant favor toward them. Once he rises for the meal, he'll be favorably disposed because of their gift. That's the unexpected welcome that they have. But in the final verses, as Joseph returns here to the house with his brothers where they're waiting and, and where they're anticipating that meal, we see that things still do not go as expected. In the final verses, we have the unexpected meal. Let's go ahead and read the, the final verses. The unexpected meal in Egypt. Verse 26. When Joseph came home, they brought in to the house to him the present which was in their hand and bowed to the ground before him. Then he asked them about their welfare and, and said, Is your old father well of whom you spoke? Is he still alive? They said, Your servant, our father, is well. He is still alive. They bowed down in homage. As he lifted his eyes and saw his brother Benjamin, his mother's son, he said, Is this your youngest brother of whom you spoke to me? And he said, May God be gracious to you, my son. Joseph hurried out, for he was deeply stirred over his brother, and he sought a place to weep, and he entered his chamber and wept there. Then he washed his face and came out, and he controlled himself and said, Serve the meal. So they served him by himself, and them by themselves, and the Egyptians who ate with him by themselves, because the Egyptians could not eat bread with the Hebrews, for that is loathsome to the, Hebrew, to the Egyptians. Now they were seated before him, the firstborn according to his birthright, and the youngest according to his youth. And the men looked at one another in astonishment. He took portions to them from his own table, but Benjamin's portion was five times as much as any of theirs. So they feasted and drank freely with him. If we go back up here to the beginning of the section, this final section in verse 26, Things begin in an unsurprising fashion, really. As soon as Joseph comes, the, they, they, they see their host arrive. As soon as he enters, um, the, the brothers present their gifts. Remember, they don't recognize he's Joseph. He's just the, the ruler. As soon as they see him, they, they present the gift they've, they've readied, and they bow before him once more, just as they did on their first trip, showing their humility before this great ruler of Egypt. It's when the questions start up that the things begin to, to seem a little less routine. That, that first act, that's, that's what you'd expect them to present their gift and bow. But then Joseph greets them in a comforting fashion, not accusatory at all. He does ask questions like he did the first time, but this time the questions do not assume that they're spies. There, there's no inherent accusation behind any of the words. Instead, he inquires about his father and his father's well-being. Uh, of course, we, we know that their father is Joseph's father. Joseph probably truly wants to know, is my dad still alive? His, from Joseph's perspective, concern about Jacob's welfare is natural. But from the brother's perspective, why did, would this ruler care about our dad back up in, in Canaan? He's a mighty ruler of Egypt. The interest of this mighty ruler and their father must have been rather unexpected. Notice how, how the brothers respond. Once more, they bow down to Joseph. In fact, Moses adds this time that they bow down in homage. The idea is that they physically showed deferential respect for the ruler, and they, they showed that in the way they bowed in before him, given homage. The fulfillment of those long ago dreams that, that launched everything in, into process has come out in a very literal fashion. They, they recognize this man as one who's exalted over them. And they physically show that by, by the way they bow before him. Having asked about his father, 
Joseph then moves on to asking questions about Benjamin. He asked the brothers whether the young man with them was the younger brother they'd spoken of. Now, I'll let you decide what's underlying that question. You have to decide, was Joseph able or not able to recognize Benjamin after all these intervening years? Certainly, as brothers go, Benjamin would have aged the most in those years in appearance. He was a, a young lad when Joseph was sold into slavery, and now he would have been a grown man, so he would have changed the most. So the, the question may have been genuine. Is this, is this Benjamin? Because Joseph might have looked at him and said, I'm, I don't really know. Or it may have been simply designed to direct the attention of all the brothers upon Benjamin. All we know is that from what we have recorded, Joseph doesn't wait for an answer to the question. He asks, is this your brother Benjamin? And then immediately Joseph pronounces a blessing on Benjamin. And for the third time in the chapter, God's name is invoked. May God be gracious to you, my son. May God be gracious to you, my son. I wonder what the brothers thought when Joseph then suddenly jumped up and left the room after he pronounced this surprising blessing. Joseph hadn't said anything like that to any of the other brothers, but now he says that. Again, they don't know if Joseph, or maybe I should just say the ruler hadn't send, said anything like that to any of the other brothers, but he says that to Benjamin, then immediately dashes out of the room. They probably stood there looking at each other in surprise, in curiosity, in fear, I don't know. We, we, they're probably just sitting there looking at each other, wondering what do we do now? But while the brothers are standing around looking at each other, I want us to pause a little bit and look at the significant theological point that's buried in verse 30. We need to understand that this is not simply motion overcoming Joseph at this moment. I mentioned earlier that verse 14 was the first time we have the word mercy in the Bible. Well, truly buried in our English translation. In fact, it's buried not just in the New American Standard, but in every English translation I checked. Verse 30 contains the second occurrence of the, the word mercy in the Bible. In fact, the, the two verses in this chapter, verse 14 and verse 30, they are the only appearances of the word mercy anywhere in Genesis. Here in verse 30, it, it's part of the phrase that we have translated into English, he was deeply stirred. There, there just isn't a good way to translate the Hebrew words that are used there to bring mercy out, but mercy's in that phrase. He is deeply stirred. As Joseph prayed for God to show grace to Benjamin, Joseph himself was moved in mercy because of Benjamin. That's the picture we're supposed to make. He, may God be gracious to you. And as he prays for God's grace to come upon Benjamin, Joseph is deeply moved in mercy over his brother. Remember back in verse 14, Jacob had prayed that God Almighty would grant mercy to his sons in the sight of the other man. Of course, the man we know as Joseph. Now, when that man, when Joseph, beholds the sight of his brother, Benjamin, God answers Jacob's prayer by stirring emotions within Joseph and those emotions move him toward mercy. They move him to show mercy to his brothers. It's the very emotion that Jacob had prayed God would grant. Mercy. Think about it. Mercy is the restraint of delivering deserved punishment. Mercy is undeserved. We deserve punishment, and mercy is the withholding of that, the restraint of, of well-deserved punishment not giving someone what is truly deserved. As I said earlier, mercy ultimately comes from God. Yet God often dispenses his mercy through human agents. Joseph's brothers do not deserve mercy for selling him into slavery. Mercy is the last thing they deserve. Yet God uses the sight of, uh, of, of his brother, Benjamin, a, a brother who was not sold into slavery as Really, he could have been. Again, remember, there's been 20-plus years here. Actually, probably more than that. There, there's been years. They could have sold Benjamin because of favoritism into slavery. They could have killed him. They could have done a lot of things. But the fact that he's there, he's standing among his brothers. They brought him down. 
that moves Joseph to show mercy to those who do not deserve it. And by doing that, Joseph pictures God's mercy toward all undeserving sinners. We should yearn that, that God would use us in a similar fashion, that, that we would be used by God to picture mercy. Now, I'm sure we all have people in our lives who have wronged us. I mean, we, all you have to do is little, live a little while in the world and people will do things to us that, that wrong us. These are people who do not deserve mercy from us. They've wronged us. Yet, yet we are men and women who have experienced the mercy of God. We're on the receiving end of God's mercy. We know how precious mercy is. How wonderful it is that, that God grants us then opportunities to, to picture his mercy to others. And we do that by showing it to others. Who knows? When we show mercy to others, we may even be someone's answer to prayer that we would show mercy. The one thing that we know now, I don't think I'm, I'm giving away too much of the future story. The, the one thing we know is that the mercy that Joseph shows his brothers becomes the foundation for the reconciliation that God brings into this family. If Joseph treated his brothers as they deserved, he'd throw them all into prison. His father would die along with those left up in Canaan, and there'd be no reconciliation. But that's not what happens. Because Joseph reflects the mercy of God by showing mercy to his brothers. Reconciliation turns vengeance that people deserve over to God and offers mercy. That's where reconciliation comes from. So let's come back to the text. And let's consider the verses after Joseph composes himself and, and rejoins his brothers because showing that compassion, that, that mercy, it, it made him emotional. So he comes back to his brothers for the meal that's been prepared. And, and the picture that forms in my mind is one of Joseph coming out of his inner chambers. He dashed off really fast. No words given. He brothers stand out and look at each other. For that matter, probably the Egyptians that were all gathering in the room were looking at each other too. What do we do now? They wait. He comes back and, and he doesn't do anything. He just goes to his spot for the meal and says, serve the food. Can you get the picture of that? This mighty ruler, we've waited. He walks back and says, serve the food. Well, with that command, the, the final unexpected component of the meal arrives. Obviously, everyone has to go to a spot for the food to be served. They, and protocol dictated that Joseph, the, the powerful ruler, he would eat by himself. He'd be off by himself. The, and probably, maybe even raised, who knows, up on a pedestal or something, the the Egyptians, believe it or not, were, were prejudiced people, and their prejudices precluded them from dining with the Hebrews at the same table. So we have three separate seating arrangements. You have Joseph by himself, you have his brothers sitting at their seating area, and then you have the Egyptians that were dining there eating at another area. Really, there's nothing surprising about that arrangement considering the prejudice of the day and, and the protocols of the day. What was surprising is after the brothers were seated, they realized that we're seated exactly in our birth order, from the oldest down to the youngest. That was shocking. That was really shocking. The men looked at each other in astonishment. Or, or as possible, the brothers looked at one another in dismay because the, the word at the end of verse 33 can be translated either as astonishment or dismay. The, the word simply means that the, someone is affected with wonder, and that wonder can be positive or negative depending on, on the context. Now in this set, setting, I kind of think a negative wonder might be more probable. They don't know what's been going on, but they've, they're still in back of their mind waiting for the hammer to fall, and now we're lined up exactly in our birth order Remember, as far as the, the brothers know, there's no way this ruler could have such intimate knowledge of them to determine what their birth order is. I, I would guess when they saw their seating arrangement, they saw it as an omen of some kind and were most likely dismayed. They probably did not recognize it as a positive sign. The only possible conclusion they could draw, remember they had already had the hint, God's bringing that which is buried to light the only possible conclusion they could draw is that God's intervening in their lives 
because of what they had done to the one brother who's not seated at that table. There's 11 brothers lined up in court and seating area, but when you get down by Benjamin, you have a gap. There should be a 12th brother inserted there, and he's not here. Yet, exactly what God's doing would be a mystery to them as they sat at that table and looking at each other. And then the surprises for the meal are not finished. As the food is served, this ruler of Egypt, this man who, as far as the brothers are concerned, can determine whether they live or die, this man takes food from his own table and serves them. And then he gives Benjamin five times as much as the rest received. They could not help but have their attention drawn to this act by their fathers, or of their father's favorite son, that, that the favored son again gets more. Now, Joseph possibly is creating an opportunity for these old animosities against a favored son to, to come to the surface again to see how the brothers respond when, when clear favoritism is shown to one that historically they would have despised for that. Well, what we observe is that rather than becoming stressed and upset about it, the brothers actually relax and enjoy the meal. They feast and drink freely with Benjamin there. The unexpected meal in Egypt. We, we end that ch the chapter here with everyone enjoying their meal. Clearly, we're, we're in the middle of the story. It's kind of an awkward place to, to pause, but that's where our chapter division pauses. It's as good as any for us to stop tonight. The test that, that began the prior chapter to, to see whether these brothers have been transformed by God is still ongoing, really. Essentially, we have a second version of the, the test being set up tonight. But that test is incomplete. Not just the results are in, in, inconclusive, yet we're not to the results. It's incomplete. We're testing if there's any response to favoritism, but we're not finished. The test isn't done yet. What we can say is that in this chapter, the, the brothers have been hit with one unexpected thing after another, and they've responded, yes, with wonderment, maybe even some dismay, but what they have not responded with is any sign whatsoever of jealousy or animosity. While they will face more testing before Joseph is ready to conclude that these are changed men, you'd have to say at, the, at this point the read so far is good. Of course, taking the hope that comes from this chapter into the next chapter, we'll have to wait a couple weeks. Next week on our schedule, we have our spiritual family night. And as I've already said, we're not pressing further tonight. So we have to wait to see if the, the dangling of hope pays out if the test keeps going. What I do want to do, as we've done with each chapter, though, as we come to the end of this, ask ourselves, what lesson can we learn from the events that were recorded in this chapter? Again, we're at a midpoint. We're not seeing the, the overall lesson of this whole section of Genesis yet, but, but Moses does not place any details into the chapter by accident. These details are here to teach. So we should teach, or we should look for what can we learn from what is being taught here. I think the best way that we can spot the, the main idea of this chapter is if we consider the three times that God is specifically brought into the dialogue. In, in verse 4, God's mercy is referenced for the first time as, as God is addressed there and his mercy is brought in. Then in verse 23, God is, is referenced again, this time regarding his provision for the chosen family. And then the third time God enters the dialogue is with a reference to his grace. So we have God's mercy, God's provision, and God's grace. These are certainly three things that, as God's people, we need to get through life. We need God's mercy, God's provision, and God's grace. These are three things that, that we must continually trust God to give us. So the way I put these three things together is, if just along this line, God's people, us, must trust God's mercy and grace for all necessary provisions of life. God's people must trust God's mercy and grace for all necessary provisions of life. You know, like, in my mind, this lesson, like many of the lessons that we've seen as we've been working our way through this extended story, there, there's nothing about this lesson that's unique. 
God's people must trust God's mercy and grace for all necessary provisions of life. There, there's nothing unique. This is, is an idea that, that we've seen before, yet it's one that I believe we need to be reminded of over and over. I also believe that the reason this lesson is not unique is because God is faithful. He's so faithful that he does remind us of this idea over and over. And often the way that God reminds us of this idea is not just through his word, but he also reminds us in a very similar way to how it was brought before Joseph's brothers. God reminds us through the very surprising circumstances of life. God brings things about in our life that we have no control over. We must trust him. God throws a twist at us that, that we never saw coming. We, we must trust him. God gives us an emotional shock, and we must trust him. He leaves us confused or stunned or dismayed, and we must trust him. God uses all sorts of unexpected events to remind us that God's people must trust God's mercy and grace for all necessary provisions of life. We're not in control. We are totally and completely dependent on God's grace and mercy for all the necessary provisions of life. Father, I pray tonight that you would help us to remember this truth. You are a good God. You are a gracious God, a merciful God, a God who is faithful, a God who does give us all that we need, all the provisions that are necessary for this life. In fact, not just for a physical life, we're reminded that you give us all that's required for life and godliness everything that we need for our spiritual well-being as well, because you are a gracious, merciful, good God. So, Father, I pray that you would help us be men and women who trust you for these things. May we be men and women that not only trust you, but may we be thankful as we experience them, and may we then display them to the world around us so that more and more know of the God who grants mercy and grace along with the necessary provisions of life. May we show God to our world. We ask that you would help us do this in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.